is that he has been at almost all of the uh, digital uh, economy conferences that we've held in Toulouse since the very first one in January 2001. So that means that he qualifies as a veteran of the series and uh, we're extremely grateful that he keeps coming. So Hal, thank you and you have 15 minutes for your introduction. Thank you, Paul. And thanks for having this at a, at a reasonable time for us West Coasters. I've been getting up at uh, 3 and 3.30 to talk to some conferences in Europe. And uh, believe me, I think I'd rather have the jet lag. Anyway, uh, by the way, you were breaking up a little bit, just to warn you, the, uh, vo the voice was uh, breaking up. So watch out for that um, uh, outage you discussed. Okay, I want to talk about reputations and recommendations. So I added a little topic. What's the value of information? Well, we all know that. Uh, it helps you make better decisions. What's the value of data? Well, it helps you get better information. And then you can use that information to get better knowledge, better understanding, and all of these uh, pieces are part of the famous uh, data pyramid. Data to information to knowledge and to uh, understanding and uh, both rep reputations and recommendations are uh, important in that. Now, what's the difference? Well, a reputation, a bad reputation, as I think implicitly at least, a recommendation, don't go to this restaurant or you won't like this movie or whatever. And if I can borrow a little bit from auction theory, uh, think of the distinction between common value common value auction, where you've got something that's the same uh, item for everyone, but they could, um, there's the same value to everyone. They just don't know uh, how valuable that is. Uh, like offshore oil lease, the work that uh, Bob Wilson did so many years ago. Uh, so think of a common value auction. Well, the same thing with reputation. Everybody agrees on quality, let's say, but they have different noisy views. And so what you wanna do is you wanna aggregate that uh, information in some way in order to get a single score for the reputation. And then the other distinction would be private value. There you might have different preferences for attributes. So for example, you and I could uh, have the same taste in movies or in music or, uh, or food or other things. And there uh, they could be common they could be different, they could be private values, it could be public values, same general idea. It's not a contradiction to say the food was of high quality, but I didn't like it because I'm expressing their point about my private value, even though I agree with the public point that the restaurant was a nice restaurant, I just wasn't fond of the cuisine. Now, reputations, the first time I ran into this is kind of an interesting story. The FTC sponsored a meeting in 2005 about online auctions. So I gave a paper there, the paper I wrote on uh, position auctions many years ago. But I talked to some of the people at the FTC about why they got into this area. Well, it turns out it was all because of eBay. So eBay back in 2005 in the early 2000s was selling collectibles. They had buyers and sellers, they had all sorts of things. And every now and then a transaction would go wrong uh, the person would ship something he didn't ask for, or, or there was a, some damage on it and so on. And so uh, if you went to the eBay site and you clicked on the button to file a complaint about a seller, you clicked on that button and you were taken to the FTC website. <laughs> so all of a sudden, one day the FTC started getting thousands of complaints of the form uh, he said he'd send it uh, first class and he sent it second class. Or he said there were, it was in prime condition, but there was a scratch on it and so on and so on. And all these things were flowing into the FTC because the uh, eBay decided they just outsource their whole uh, merchant quality uh, capability. The FTC said, we better learn about this. So we have to have some uh, policies to deal with this. And of course, what a change from today because today the quality of the reputation is something that's viewed as very important by the, by the websites, by the platforms like Amazon and, and, uh, and Yelp and other places. They invest a lot of effort into trying to come up with good quality uh, measures. And a recommendations, this sort of sister topic, 
Uh, back in 1996, a computer scientist named Paul Resnick wrote uh, his thesis on collaborative filtering. And um, the idea of collaborative filtering is I could have a list of all the movies I liked or a score for the movies indicating how much I liked them. You could have a similar list. If we had a lot of overlap in the movies we've seen, then it's probably the case that that's predictive for the movies we might want to see. So in fact, the um, collaborative filtering is just a way to automate the sharing of, uh, of, of ratings. Find people that are similar to you and their historical preferences and then use that to extrapolate to uh, new, uh, new choices. You could also add in attributes of the person, attributes of the product. But the really nice thing is you don't need that. You just need a rank list or a list that indicates this is what I like. You have a list of this is what you like. We compare the two and then offer each other the difference, the set difference between those, uh, those things. And in fact, mathematically, the, the, the way these recommendation systems have been built uh, nowadays is to think of it as a matrix completion problem. You have products, you have people, you have a matrix that's partially filled in, and what you want to do is you want to fill in the rest of that matrix. And so there are a variety of ways to, uh, to do this, and they work very well. Uh, we had one for recipes once, and it was great. All the vegetarians found each other very quickly. And uh, on the other hand, we had one once for jokes. And <laughs> there were a number of jokes, and those were not as good because the joke had this element of surprise to it uh, so that past behavior wasn't necessarily predictive of future behavior. Now, in some of these papers that, that we're going to hear in a few minutes, there's a discussion about uh, incentives, or at least there's, a, even if it's a, sometimes a background discussion, maybe the way to do it is to make ratings more like a recommender system because the incentives are very good in a recommender system. What do they do? They, I want to be honest when I reveal my preferences for these products because the quid pro quo is I'm going to get helpful recommendations from you and vice versa. So incentives work pretty well there. And maybe if we looked at people who were doing a lot of rating, then uh, if they had similar rating, they were good uh, recommenders for, uh, if, they, if they had similar ratings, uh, then they would have a reason to kind of join up and uh, again, provide honest or accurate ratings in a way that uh, somebody was doing it randomly or doing it for hire, as we, we'll hear about in a few minutes, would not have those same, uh, same incentives. Now, one of the um, points that is useful, use, worthwhile making about, about recommendations and, and ratings is that you can use uh, transformations. If you find somebody who has just the opposite preferences from you, that's perfect because then you can do exactly what they don't recommend. In fact, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the suggestions I've heard is maybe what you should do is you find such a person who's exactly the opposite of you, then you should marry them because then uh, you'll always be able to get good recommendations from each other just by inverting those, uh, those uh, preferences. In fact, there's the old nursery rhyme, Jack Spratt. Remember, Jack Spratt would eat no fat, his wife would eat no lean, and so between them both, they licked the batter clean. So there was always something to like uh, between the two. So, um, by the way, I will tell you another, uh, one other story about the uh, recommendations and, uh, and ratings. And uh, I organized the world's first conference on uh, collaborative filtering. And the very first session, the first meeting that was in 1995, I think, 95 or 96, the very first question was, what should we call these things? Obviously, collaborative filtering is not a very good name because people have no idea what that means. It, Turns out specialists find it uh, meaningful. Uh, but the suggestion I said, why not, why not call our recommender systems? People said recommender systems, recommender systems. That's a good idea. And so now that's been the, uh, the name of the, uh, of the whole uh, enterprise. And of course, it's also extremely important uh, in terms of business models for uh, platforms because people want guidance, they want help, they want recommendations. And uh, that's a big part of the business. Now, the papers in this session, let me just run through them very quickly. Uh, I thought they were extremely interesting. 
Uh, Philippus et al. said rating inflation is common. And uh, you probably all heard the story about Lake Wobegon where all the children above average, it's inflated so much, it's just uh, broken all the laws of arithmetic. Uh, one of the problems we had once uh, when I was at the University of Michigan was how to deal with great inflation because people uh, in other uh, social sciences were, we thought, inflating their grades of their students inappropriately. And one of the proposals that came out, which I think was quite interesting, was to publish the student's grade along with their rank. So you could say they got an uh, A grade and uh, only 20% of the people got A's or only 10% of the people got A's. So you could publish the distribution of the uh, score along with the score itself. And I think that was a very helpful idea that can be used more often. And we see that, of course, when you report class ranking and, and that kind of uh, thing. So, um, so that uh, A may or may not mean anything, but the top 10% of the class, that's uh, meaningful uh, because it's doing this ordinal uh, measure. <coughs> now, Leyden et al wrote uh, their paper on the incentives to upgrade. And I thought that was extremely interesting that the, the fact that uh, Apple uh, set the system resets to zero whenever there was an update. And so they had to, that of course ended up discouraging uh, an upgrade. If you had a good rating and you decided to upgrade, then you go back down to not having any ratings at all, which was a big mess. So uh, I thought it was really quite an inter interesting uh, discussion. In fact, we had exactly the same problem or very similar problem with Android because Android phones were sold through the carrier in many cases, and the carrier was responsible for the over-the-air update. But as soon as they updated, their help system would go down because it would be overloaded of people trying to figure out how this new uh, capability in the phones worked or why this uh, menu item and move from here to there, et cetera, et cetera. So actually we had set up the program so as to discourage these ratings because uh, we made the carriers responsible support. Now that's reasonable because we knew everybody had the phone, but not everybody had Wi-Fi at that time. Nowadays, everybody has Wi-Fi. So the upgrades to Android take place generally over the uh, over the Wi-Fi rather than uh, over the air. And uh, Google has taken on more and more responsibility for managing those uh, those upgrades. But it's very important because upgrades are critical and uh, knowing who should do it and what the impact will be, that's a, that's a very important question in the, uh, in the industry. Uh, next paper, so Presupio on uh, fake reviews market. Uh, if you think about fake reviews, I think, as far as I can tell, they're just equivalent to false advertising, which is illegal in most places, but it's done by this very fragmented uh, market rather than by competitors or uh, other, uh, other uh, companies. So you need a system that can deal with this in parallel ways. If a company is falsely advertising, you want there to be a penalty to that. And if individuals are falsely advertising, uh, then uh, you want some sort of way to detect and deal with that. But who, who should police them? That's the question. Should it be the FTC? Well, I, I think the scale, uh, that, that, that's unlikely to really work if you have a single regulatory agency that's uh, engaged with this uh, rating, uh, Facebook, I don't know, Google, whatever. Uh, Section 230 has this interesting consequence that in fact, if somebody is lying on your system, the platform owner is not liable for that uh, lying, whether it's lying about competitors, whether it's lying about, uh, about politics. So I think it still is a uh, important question of how that can be managed. The platform itself has good incentives, but they're not, uh, not perfect. But they invest a lot in it. Think of Amazon, for example, who invests uh, really substantial amounts in trying to track down uh, uh, untrusted or fallacious uh, reviews. And then uh, on to Stahl, when and why do people rate? And uh, I think he has a very nice answer. The group has a very nice answer on that. Uh, they are likely to rate when the gap between expectations and actuality are large. They model that as a Bayesian. They've got a big gap between the prior 
in the posterior. And uh, that model for rating uh, explains various stylized facts, as we'll hear in a few minutes. And finally, the last paper by Troncoso is on the, uh, and his colleagues, uh, is about the impact of gender on reviewing behavior. And that's an extremely interesting paper, too. They looked at cases in... Um... Uh, uh, so Jack, uh, uh, I'm sorry, you're going to have to begin thinking about wrapping up. Oh, I'm, I, this is my last, uh, last item, okay. so it'll, it'll, be, it'll be done in a minute, one minute. Uh, is a hotel manager allowed to respond to reviews? And in some cases, I found this very helpful where you look at a hotel, for example, people have an open line, you can read uh, what their experiences are every now and then you have a bad experience. And when you have a bad experience, the, um, the manager can step in and respond to it uh, in some way. Now, the problem is that can lead to confrontation that you have a debate going back and forth. And the uh, argument in this paper or the finding in this paper, I should say, is that this has a bigger impact on women's likelihood to uh, engage in this kind of confrontation versus uh, men's. And we'll, again, we'll hear about that in, in a few minutes. So I'm now wrapped up and want to be happy to turn it over to the authors to describe some of these points in more detail. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hal. If uh, you are wondering why I'm taking over from uh, Paul, it's because it seems that Paul has got uh, connection problems. Uh, he just sent, uh, called me. Uh, so the first uh, uh, speaker is uh, Benjamin Layden from Cornell University. Uh, ben, can you share your screen? Yeah, let me get that. Gosh, up it's here. working. Wonderful. And so you've got eight minutes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you to the organizers for including me on this program and for Hal for the great uh, introduction to this session. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview today of my paper, Platform Design and Innovation Incentives, Evidence from the Product Rating System on Apple's App Store. There's a, a somewhat longer talk available in, you know, in a video form on the conference website, uh, and then the paper is available as well. Uh, so in this paper, uh, you know, motivated by, I think, a growing public policy interest and, of course, a longstanding sort of academic interest, in how the design of platforms can affect intra-platform competitive outcomes. I'm gonna ask how the design of Apple's product rating system in particular on the App Store affected product innovation there. Uh, the reason I think this is an interesting context to sort of look at this type of question is that for essentially the first decade of this platform, the rating system was structured in such a way as to penalize updates by higher quality products. Um, right, so this creates sort of a perverse incentive scheme, and so I'm interested to see whether developers were are in fact responsive to it. Um, leveraging a change in this policy in 2017, what I find is that developers were in fact responsive to these incentives, that developers under the initial system updated less frequently, and, and in fact, this less frequent innovation was probably the result of lower investment or lower product innovation overall, as opposed to sort of delayed uh, and bundled less frequent updates. Uh, as I'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so what was the, the policy that was in place? Well, uh, you know, for, for that first decade, roughly, uh, basically the way your rating would be calculated, the rating that would show up all across the App Store would be calculated is they would add up all the ratings and reviews and average all the ratings from reviews from the current version of your app. So when you produce an update, you put out a new version, you're going to go from your nice five-star review like you, or rating like you have for this modern combat game you can see on the right to this no rating sign that you see for Enigma 2, okay? So there's essentially a reputational penalty you're paying every time you update your app. Uh, and then once you get five or more ratings, then the stars will reappear and it'll be whatever you're getting at that point. But there's this period where you're not gonna have any ratings displayed. Um, so this is gonna discourage innovation at the high end uh, it actually might encourage innovation at the low end to the extent that no ratings are better than, than one star ratings or something like that, uh, but that won't be the focus for, for today. Um, so this was famously very unpopular with developers on the platform. And finally, in 2017, the executive in charge of the App Store admitted that this was kind of a stupid incentive scheme and they introduced a new policy, uh, which was basically to give developers a choice. When you produce an update, you can either reset your rating just like under the old system or you can choose to keep all the ratings since whenever the last reset may have been. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the history of this system. 
In the paper, I essentially ask three questions. So the first is whether or not the observed relationship between the average rating and the likelihood of updating changes with the policy change. In other words, was there this distortionary effect? You can sort of think of the blue line as that the, the updating likelihood for a bunch of developers under the initial policy. And after the change, do we see a shift back to that sort of optimal red line? Um, once I find that there was in fact uh, an impact of this initial policy, I'm gonna ask how the size of uh, the effect varies with the size of the reputational penalty an app faces. So you can imagine some developers are going to be very dependent on the rating system on the app store. Other developers may not actually really care what their score is uh, and, and we'll see sort of heterogeneous impacts there. The final question is going to be whether or not we're really losing innovation here, right? So what I'll show you under sort of question one is that the frequency of innovation was much lower in the initial policy, under the initial policy. Uh, but you know, that could either mean we're sort of throwing out ideas or investing less, or it could mean that I'm just holding and bundling up a bunch of updates and releasing them in larger packages less frequently. Now, even in that case, there's sort of a dynamic welfare loss. So this isn't necessarily sort of good from a societal perspective, but it would be less bad than if there's just less innovation overall. And so we'll look into that. The way we'll sort of address that is to see once the policy changes in 2017, whether sort of small bug fix updates become relatively more frequent because you no longer face this large reputational penalty for sort of minor revisions to the product. Okay, the empirical strategy, lots more details in the 15 minute video version of this talk as well as the paper, but it's basically to estimate a linear probability model to determine whether this ratings updating uh, relationship changes after the policy change. Okay, I'm gonna use a weekly panel of iOS apps in three categories, education, productivity, and utilities uh, in order to, to study this question. Um, in order to answer that third question, we're gonna to have to classify the content of app updates as either small or large in some sense. I'm gonna do this in two ways. One, by looking at the version number of these apps, uh, there's sort of this historical system for changing version numbers in certain ways to indicate small or large updates. However, that's not always followed. It seems to be somewhat falling out of favor with a lot of developers. So I'll also look at text release notes that are written by these developers describing what they're doing with each update. And I'll classify updates as either large sort of feature adding updates or small bug fixing updates. Okay, so what do I find here? Uh, to summarize sort of the main results from the paper, uh, the sort of top line result is that the original policy decreased the frequency of product innovation. The developers were in fact responsive to this. Uh, the average app in the store is gonna increase innovation or product updating by about 8% after the policy change. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of heterogeneity around this. In particular, it becomes really clear in the data that the size of the reputational penalty matters. So first, I find no effect of this initial, penalty, this initial policy on the updating behavior of the most popular apps. So you know, Microsoft Word doesn't care what its rating is on the App Store because it's so dominant in, in the field or in its submarket. Whereas my either, you know, very niche note-taking app may be really dependent on the ratings and, and that content. And so I'm going to be really responsive to that initial policy. Similarly, I find no effect for apps with the highest arrival rate of review. So remember the reputational penalty is that I go from my nice five-star review to that no rating sign until I have five or more ratings when the numbers start showing up again, or the stars start showing up again. Uh, some developers are gonna get lots of reviews coming in constantly. So this is gonna be a very short-lived penalty and those developers aren't very responsive to the initial policy. Other developers, it can take months to get that many reviews or ratings. And so there the penalty is gonna be very severe and you're gonna see a much larger response from, from those developers. Okay, to that third question then, of course, whether or not this innovation is sort of lost or, or just delayed, um, there's suggestive evidence that the original policy did in fact lead to lost product innovation. So under the version number approach of classifying updates as sort of small or large, I find no evidence of a relative increase in the small updates after the policy changes. This allows us to reject this theory that developers are holding on to innovations and bundling them into less frequent releases uh, during the initial policy. Using the release notes, those text descriptions of these updates, the evidence is a little bit more mixed. Uh, but what it appears is happening is in the education category, there's evidence of a relative increase in small updates after the policy change, which means we can't reject either of these two theories, either the bundling theory or the lost innovation one. So it's not clear what's going on there right now. Uh, but in utilities and productivity, my other two categories of apps, there we don't find evidence of an increase in uh, the relative frequency of small updates. And so we can, again, in those cases, reject this theory of sort of bundled delayed innovation in favor of this idea that developers were actually investing less on the platform. 
Okay, so uh, you know this was a fairly short talk, so I won't just repeat everything I just said. But uh, you know, I think the big takeaway here is that the the structure and the incentives created by this this rating system had a meaningful effect on on innovation on the platform and investment on the platform, which I hope contributes some new empirical evidence to our understanding of both rating systems more generally, but also how uh, how the design of platforms can have uh, you know a real effect on intra-platform competitive outcomes, which I think is is of course of growing interest these days uh, with lots of current concerns about dominant platforms and the behavior of platform owners. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Benjamin. That was a uh, fantastic timekeeping and a really fascinating presentation. Um, our next speaker is Konrad Stahl, uh, who is going to talk about when and why do buyers rate in online markets. Konrad, the floor is yours. Uh, you need to unmute yourself, Conrad, I think. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, it didn't work. Uh, well, it's, it, I can hear you now, no problem. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you uh, for uh, the organizers, as usual, and thank you, Hal, for the introduction. Uh, let me announce that the, the, a longer presentation, a somewhat longer presentation is available on the website. Uh, so uh, you see the title of this talk. Uh, let me start right away. Uh, the motivation is an obvious one. Uh, everyone knows that rating is important, in particular in online markets. Uh, the key point we want to focus on is that rating is voluntary and uh, every every evidence on this uh, shows that uh, rating is highly non-random. Uh, in particular, the, the standard evidence shown is that uh, the rating concentrates on the extremes in the distribution from many positives to a few negatives, uh, the so-called J distribution. Uh, this uh, uh, gives rise to a number of questions uh, of which we want we, we don't answer any uh, everyone, but uh, at least a, a subset of them. The first question is truthfulness of buyer rating. Uh, we don't give an answer to this, but the selectivity of raters amongst the buyers is uh, is an interesting question we address. And the, uh, the selectivity in particular of the individual buyer's rating decision. And uh, then this, uh, this gives rise to uh, the, uh, by my standards, key question, uh, as to whether an unweight rating index uh, that is typically used in, uh, in, in onlines, online markets is biased and uh, thus in, uninformative. Okay, we, our contribution, we provide a, 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 a little theoretical model. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's a pretty elementary model, but it, it uh, explains a lot by our take. Uh, it explains the decision to rate, uh, i.e. selectivity at the individual level. And the key idea is that the bias utility uh, from rating, as Hal has said, uh, is increasing in the intensity of learning from a transaction. And learning is the difference in, implies that is involved uh, involving the difference between prior and posterior belief. And the key point is how the prior belief is formed. Okay. I think, uh, or we think that in spite of selectivity, rating aggregates, if carefully constructed, can be unbiased and thus informative. Uh, and the current uh, work, this is work in progress, is on exactly uh, uh, the fine tuning of these weights, uh, which is surprisingly difficult. The empirical results we can uh, we present here are from the eBay raw data, from the administrative data, I'm sorry. The main insights are uh, uh, the following. Uh, the intensity of rating is decreasing in the number of transactions performed by the typical seller. It's a clear decline in this density. Uh, in particular, the buyers reluctant to leave a negative rating, uh, uh, excuse me, are reluctant more and more uh, the larger the number of positives, if you want, that are typically accumulated uh, in the rating record. Um, 
Now, uh, by inverse, when the waiting record diminishes by uh, typically by a negative, say the first negative, uh, then we see an, a, a, a significant increase in the likelihood to follow up with a negative rating. And this, even if the seller is not, uh, there, there is no moral hazard uh, 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 impact uh, or generated uh, on the, on the uh, level of the seller. I will come back to this point. Uh, okay, now the, the interesting point is that uh, with our little theoretical model, we can rationalize all these results. Uh, and um, most or if not all empirical observations on rating in the literature. Let me quickly uh, walk you through the model. Uh, it's on the individual bias rating decision. We consider transactions as being of high versus low quality. Uh, the buyer forms a prior belief and that is key here based on uh, uh, the platform and seller quality that is inferred from the rating index. There is a general platform quality on which I do not elaborate right now. And there is a seller quality which is directly inferred from the rating index that is provided. Okay. Now that uh, the, uh, that rating index can be pretty general. Uh, the, the rater forms a posterior belief based on her experience that uh, uh, is generated from the transaction when uh, she has purchased. And uh, uh, as we, uh, as I just mentioned, or uh, just emphasized, you know, the benefit from rating, this is our uh, principal guiding assumption, is increasing in the absolute difference between prior and posterior. And the rating then uh, is taking place if the benefit exceeds some idiosyncratic cost. The prediction is uh, uh, quite straightforward. Uh, the first prediction is that an increase in the rating index decreases the rating probability, and the decrease in the rating index increases the probability that a buyer rates negatively relative to that of rating positively. These are the two in, uh, predictions we take to the data. But before I go to the data, let me just illustrate uh, uh, what happens here. This is basically the difference between uh, the positive posterior belief and the prior belief as generated on the basis of uh, what I just said. And this is the difference between the negative uh, posterior belief, uh, I mean, uh, generated from a negative experience and the prior belief. You see, uh, that essentially uh, you can generate all the results from this little uh, picture. Okay. Let me go to the data. Just uh, in, I have to save on time, unfortunately. We, uh, we have uh, three samples and the guiding sample is the top 5% of the of the, the, the sellers, we start, I should say, we start uh, from, from sellers all uh, starting in a, a particular time at a particular time and we follow these sellers over time, okay? There are these three samples, the, these are the top 5% sellers we are looking at and uh, these are sellers uh, that uh, have uh, uh, at least 86 transactions in the first year. This is a balanced panel, <clears throat> so uh, there is no there is no um, truncation bias. Uh, the rating indices, I guess, are known uh, uh, in the in the scene. Uh, the eBay rating indices are the uh, percentage positives, feedback score, and the so-called DSRs, the detailed seller ratings that are differentiated. We use all indices and check the results for robustness. What we observe, uh, the obvious thing is the well-known vast dominance of positive uh, feedback that is typically uh, considered a, a per se reason for rating bias. I don't think, or we don't think that this is not necessarily so. First of all, you have a seller self-selection onto the platform, and then you have a platform selection strategy, which uh, uh, plays a, a key role in, in this. And uh, that is probably under uh, appreciated. 
Yes, uh, Conrad, you're, you're running out of time. Could I yeah. ask you to try and wrap up as quickly as possible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, is the first, this is the first empirical result. Uh, you see here this uh, decline in the probability of rating uh, with an increasing number of the transactions in the horizontal axis. <clears throat> uh, uh, the, the second result is a bit more involved. Uh, we, we construct, we construct uh, several Subsamples of that sample. Uh, uh, the key, the key sample we are looking at is that uh, that is controlling for seller behavior by looking at transactions before some time at which the first negative arrives and the feedback is given uh, thereafter. And uh, we see when we look at the, the effect of uh, <clears throat> of the first negative then that. Uh, in this class too, this is exactly the sample I was looking at. Uh, uh, you see a significant increase in uh, leaving a negative uh, feedback. So there is a clear, uh, uh, a clear path dependence in leaving a negative feedback. Okay, uh, that is incidentally concentrating on uh, on the young buyers rather than the old buyers. That is uh, the experienced buyers. And uh, uh, it, it is concentrating on the earlier sellers, the young sellers, okay? So uh, uh, let me summarize. Uh, uh, I think what I just said, I, uh, one key point I want to make here, <clears throat> uh, the rating decision is path dependent, which is uh, an interesting point by my take. And uh, uh, the, the rating index, uh, 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 is clearly inefficiently a, a standard rating index that is unweighed is inefficiently aggregating the information, even if the individual ratings are truthful, which is assumed here in our, in our exercise. And the work in progress involves unbiased rating index uh, constructions. And uh, uh, we, we give preliminary results, but I'm afraid that I'm yeah. running out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Conrad. Uh, uh, this is uh, Jacques. I'm uh, taking over. Uh, Paul is again uh, cut off. Uh, thank you, uh, Conrad. Uh, the next uh, speaker is, uh, sorry, uh, Isamar. Is that the right way to pronounce it? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. OK, so I'm going to share my screen. <coughs> um... Does it look okay? That's perfect. Okay. So hello everyone. Um, my name is Isamar Troncoso. I'm a PhD candidate in marketing at USC. And today I'm going to be presenting a joint work with Davide Proserpio and Francesca Valsesia, which we titled Does Gender Matter? And what we are doing is exploring or trying to investigate the effect of management responses on reviewing behavior. And I wanted to start by just briefly illustrating what is the context that we are studying, uh, which is online reviews and management responses, right? So you may be already familiar with online reviews, which um, we know usually consists of a rating, some text, some description too, and at least in some review platforms, we will also have some information of the author. Right? Now, the second component here that you may be less familiar with are these responses from the manager, which in simple words are basically a message that the, some representative of the business can post, which is in direct response to a specific review. So it's like a one-to-one -one message here. And it's also public, it's visible. Everyone else in the platform can see this response. Okay. Now, the adoption of these management responses has become quite popular, has been gaining important popularity on platforms such as TripAdvisor or Yelp, because business see them as an effective way to manage their online reputation. Right? We know that ratings are important for them. Now, uh, we know also from the literature that these management responses may can increase the number of reviews a volume uh, business receive and will also impact the average rating. But in this paper, we're trying to understand where is this change coming from in terms of reviewers' decisions to write a review, right? Who is leaving a review now and who is not leaving a review? And formally, 
the two research questions we explore here are first, do different reviewers react differently to the presence of these management responses? And in particular, we're looking at potential differences between female and male reviewers. And if these differences exist, what are the consequences in terms of their reviewing behavior? Okay. Now, we started exploring this first research question with a survey in which we ask online review platform users, what is the reaction to the presence of management responses? Now, we found some um, interesting significant differences between female and male users, in particular, that when these reviewers have a positive experience and they want to leave a positive review, female users are more excited about the possibility that now they're talking directly to the manager, so they see them as an opportunity to praise or compliment them for the good job. But if the, neg the experience was negative and they want to leave a negative review, that is like female users are also at the same time more concerned that this might create some sort of conflict with the manager or that the manager may discredit what they're saying. Okay. Now we found this last concern particularly intriguing and we wanted to further explore whether is this just a perception driven by gender differences, or can we actually find some evidence of this on these platforms? Or in other words, whether this concern is partially explained by the way that managers actually address reviewers. Now to explore that, we analyze the tests of some management responses that we collect uh, from TripAdvisor. And we look at the differences in which some of the linguistic choices made that, that managers made depending on whether they address female reviewers or male reviewers, right? Now we know that, especially when responding to reviews, negative reviews from female users, managers tend to use fewer positive emotion words, but more negative emotion words, more negation words, more anger words with like, for example, saying that the review is a lie or something like that. And they also tend to use more their personal pronouns. So rather than directly talk to the reviewer like thank you or using the you uh, pronoun, they tend to refer like to the reviewer as she. So she did something, she said something and so on. Now, this difference may suggest that female reviewers receive some less favorable responses from the managers, but we wanted to further formalize this analysis. And for that, we build a text space uh, classifier. So we try to character, character, characterize responses on whether they are contentious or not. And by contentious, we mean that the manager is trying to discredit the reviewer, it's being confrontational with the reviewer, or maybe responding aggressively. Okay. Now, this classification is very purely on the text, the content of the message, right? It's a bag of words based um, classifier, it's a logistic regression, we try many, but the point is that it's really just based on the text, the content. But then when we look at who are these reviewers being addressed to, we know that actually responses to female reviewers are more likely to be classified as contentious. Or in other words, it seems that female reviewers are more likely to receive this kind of responses, right? So this far, we learned that female reviewers perceive responses as a potential source of conflict, and that that seems to be a well-founded conflict, that these situations can take place in these online review platforms. So we then wanted to measure or quantify what are the consequences of this in terms of reviewing activity. And to explore this, we collect the entire review history for 5,000 hotels and TripAdvisor, and we use this individual level review data to explore whether the probability that a given review comes from a female user change, change in the presence of management responses. Okay. Now, um, because of time constraints, I'm going to skip the details of the analysis, but it's basically we adopt a difference in difference strategy in which we exploit the fact that some hotels respond, but some hotels do not respond, so we have some treated and controlled hotels. And then there is some significant variation in when did they start doing that. So we have some before and after period too. Now with this analysis, we see that after managers start responding to their reviews, it is likely to see that a given negative review comes from a female user. Now, 
this analysis, of course, have some concerns. Um, all hotels may select into treatment, so we have some robustness checks with some other treatment variables, and we also replicate similar findings in a lab setting. Oh, what is also quite interesting is that we show that this effect of female users writing fewer negative reviews is stronger for hotels that write more contentious responses. Okay. And yeah, so just to write up, uh, we believe that our findings help or contribute a little bit to the understanding and reviewing behavior, this selection into who writes reviews. And our findings also have some implications for review platform and businesses. Specifically, they may be considered as a red flag, right? That there is some room for improvement to make sure that there is a fair communication process here. And that especially hotel managers are treating their customers in a fair way. And with that, I think I'm gonna close here. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Isamar. I'm not going to say she did a great job. I'm going to say you did a great job. Uh, <laughs> lots of positive words, perfectly to time. So the next speaker is uh, on reputation inflation. Hello, can you hear? Thank you very much. Uh, can you see my screen? Correctly? Yes, yes. Awesome. So thank you for having me. I wish we could do that in person, enjoying Southern France and having fantastic conversations, but this will have to do for this year. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, one phenomenon in online reputation systems that are being used in online marketplaces. Every time we look at reputation distributions on this uh, marketplaces, we see that they're overwhelmingly positive. Here's an example. Uh, from eBay, uh, here's an example from Airbnb, uh, and here's an example from our focal platform. So our focal platform for this study is an online uh, labor market uh, for freelance work. So according to this distribution, things are going really well on the platform, uh, but our first question is, is this reflective of actual very high quality transactions and how could we know? So the first thing that we do is uh, we take advantage of our data set that spans more than 10 years, and we go back in time in 2007, and we take a look at uh, what the average feedback given in each month was over time. So what we find is that um, average feedback scores have been increasing over time, and uh, up to the point that the average feedback score that's given at the end of our data set is much higher than was what was the case initially on our platform. So actually the distribution that I plotted in the previous slide was just from the last two years of our data set. So feedback scores have not always been overwhelmingly positive and they became over time. And a question here, a natural question is, is this phenomenon taking place only in our platform or is it a little bit more general? So the next thing we did is we tried to collect data from many online marketplaces and it seemed pretty general in other marketplaces that are employing similar reputation systems. Scores have been increasing over time. And if we want to go a little bit in the non-online world, this thing has been happening uh, in other rating systems. And in this case, in GPAs in US schools. So in the 1940s, only 15% of students received A's. In 2012, this percentage is 45%, much higher. And it's probably even higher in 2020. So um, the question here is, what does this reflect? In the case of colleges, it could reflect, let's say, uh, US professors becoming 300% better, or US students becoming 300% better, or you know, uh, classroom education technology, air conditioning, what have you, becoming much, much better and improving performance. So let's go back to, um, or it could of course reflect the fact that we're just giving out grades more easily for some reason. So let's go back to online marketplaces and see what that, what that translates to. So this translates to two sets of potential reasons. First, we could have improvements in platform fundamentals that increase transaction quality. This could be better cohorts uh, of people joining, people amassing more experience, um, 
better search, matching, technology, and so on. Everything that might improve transaction quality. The second set of reasons, lower standards, giving out uh, feedback more easily is what we call reputation inflation in this paper. And our next order of business is to try to disentangle these two sets of potential reasons for this increase that might be taking place at the same time. So the problem here is that we are observing this primary numerical score over time, but we're not observing transaction quality. It's unobservable and it's uh, affected by many, many things. So what we're doing here to disentangle um, inflation from improving fundamentals is we're trying to find alternative measures that might be subject to less reputation inflation or uh, no reputation inflation at all. So in this paper, we use two alternative scores. And the first score is uh, a private feedback measure that the platform started eliciting in combination uh, with public feedback. So this private feedback was given after transactions um, and the platform was not revealing it to everyone. They were just saying the employers that they would get it only to do some internal evaluation. So we have a public feedback measure and a private feedback measure for the exact same transactions. And what we see during the time that both were collected is that for the same, very same transactions, average public feedback scores increase, whereas average private feedback scores increase. So this gives us one um, way to kind of uh, see this inflation taking place. The second alternative measure that we're using is written text that is given in combination with uh, numerical feedback. And we're doing some um, slightly more sophisticated uh, natural language processing analysis in the paper, but I want to show one piece of evidence that's kind of model free and um, I think gets the point through. We see that uh, when employers uh, give the very same phrases in their written text, the feedback that they used to give in 2008 and 2015 greatly differ. So when an employer says good job, uh, they used to give 4.7 stars, 2008, now 2015, they give 4.95 stars. When they used to say terrible, they used to give 1.5 stars in 2008, whereas now they're giving 2.5 stars. So putting all of the estimates together, um, our most conservative estimate is that at least 50% of the increase we observe in uh, numerical scores is due to reputation inflation. So our next, uh, our next task in the paper is to kind of try to pin down why this is happening. And of course, there might be many reasons, but we're trying to uh, accurately pin down one of these reasons. And the way to do it is uh, writing down um, a theoretical model in the paper, uh, but let me give you the, um, the intuition behind the theoretical model. So um, the first thing that this model recognizes is that costly feedback is, uh, bad feedback is costly for the rater to give. And raters might dislike giving this bad feedback for many reasons. They might not want to harm the prospects of the rated worker. They might um, not want to harm their own future prospects because workers will avoid them if they know they're harsh raters, or they want to avoid costs that have to do with worker retaliation, such as angry emails and so on. Uh, but these costs by themselves, they would uh, probably explain only a bias in the feedback, not this trend over time. And to explain this trend over time, the second component we need to add to our model is that uh, what feedback is good and what feedback is bad changes over time. And what this means is pretty simple. If everybody gets uh, a 2.5 out of five stars, then giving somebody four stars is excellent. If everybody gets five stars out of five and giving somebody four stars is bad. So we put this thing in a model. Um, so what feedback is bad depends on the average feedback that's given on the platform at each point in time. And now employers find it costly to assign bad feedback. They incur a cost that's analogous to the cost of giving this bad feedback to the workers. And they might start lying about their uh, experience and start inflating the feedback if the cost of assigning this bad feedback becomes high enough. So this model gives us exactly what we see in the data. And uh, one last component we have in this paper is that we have a direct test for this model from uh, a change in costs to bad feedback. So what happened in our platform, as I told you before, is that they started collecting this private feedback measure. They said they would never reveal it 
to other uh, users of the platform. And they did some internal tests so that it was much more informative, much more predictive of future performance. And of course, what they uh, decided to do uh, ultimately was to start revealing it. So they started revealing this private feedback to everybody in the platform, but they started revealing in a batched uh, and anonymized manner in the sense that workers could not uh, see which employer gave which feedback and uh, each worker's private feedback score was updated every five new uh, private feedback ratings that they got. So this kind of uh, controls against uh, fears of retaliation, uh, this kind of batching and anonymization because the worker cannot trace bad feedback back to a specific employer. But on the other hand, if raters care about harm, um, then they will start not giving bad feedback and we'll start seeing this inflation. So if we go um, in uh, the series, of uh, private feedback scores over time. And we got the time where this private feedback was publicly revealed. We see exactly uh, what this model would predict. Uh, private uh, feedback scores. Look, you, I'm afraid you're out of time. Could I ask you to wrap up, please? One more slide and I'm done. Thank you very much. Uh, we see this private feedback scores are inflating immediately. So what we see is that much of these increasing feedback scores is it due to reputation inflation, seems ubiquitous across many platforms, and can be driven purely by a desire not to harm rather than fear of retaliation in the terms of raiders. So there is a lot of uh, room here for future research about the implications and market design interventions um, that can counteract this reputation inflation. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much.